Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to continue reading The Journey to the River Sea by Eva Botson. The pictures are by Kevin Hawks, and this is a puffin book. We're gonna pick up where we left off with chapter 15. This is right after Clovis has been set, uh, sent to England on the boat, and uh, Finn has decided to start his trek with the Arabella. Chapter 15. Sir Aubrey had sent the carriage to the station. He himself was going to wait for his grandson in the drawing room, if it was his grandson. Clovis sat between Mr. Trapwood and Mr. Lowe. The crows were going to hand him over personally before returning to town. It was cool. In fact, it was very cool, with an east wind blowing off Westwood uh, Moor, and Clovis drank in the air with relief. No sticky heat and no insects. He was in England at last. They had driven for at least 20 minutes down an avenue of lime trees. Clovis could see the glimmer of water between the coppices. This must be the lake where the bachelor had held Bernard's hand underwater. When suddenly the carriage curved around a bend and Westwood laid before him. It was exactly as Finn had described it. An east wing, a west wing, and a block in the middle. But it was very large, larger than he'd been able to imagine. For a moment, Clovis found his stomach lurching. The crows were easy to hoodwink. They had fawned over him all through the journey and spent their spare time at the bar. But Finn's grandfather would see through him. He was sure of that. They passed the fountain with a person on it who was strangling a snake. He seemed to have, lo lo he seemed to have lost his head, which was a pity. Then the carriage stopped outside the main entrance, and Clovis saw a crowd of people massed on the stone step, which led to the front door. There were women in blue aprons, women in black dresses, men in livery and overalls and tailcoats. Of course, the servants all lined up to greet them. Clovis's panic grew worse. He hadn't realized that there could be so many servants in the world. Then he remembered that this had happened in Little Lord Fauntleroy when Cedric had arrived from America and in the play called The Young Master when the lost heir returned to his home. The coachman opened the door. Mr. Lowe and Mr. Trapwood waited respectfully for him to get out first. Clovis squared his shoulders. He took a deep breath as he always had done before he went on stage and moved forward. And upstairs in the drawing room, Sir Aubrey put his telescope to his eye. When the boat docked at Liverpool, the crows had stopped at a gentleman's outfitter and bought a tweed suit and cap for Clovis, the best that the shop could supply. Now, as he peered through the eyepiece, Sir Aubrey saw a handsome lad, blue-eyed and sturdy, sturdy, who carried himself like a prince. The boy shook hands with the butler, the housekeeper, and the cook. Exactly as he should, and then at the top of the stairs, he turned and thanked the lesser servants for their welcome before following the butler into the house. You can see that in the picture. And Sir Aubrey's heart leapt. He had been worried, no good denying it. Bernard might have produced anything, but the boy looked splendid. He would not chatter to the servants as his father had. He was gracious, but he kept his distance. In the hall, the steward waited to show Mr. Lowe and Mr. Trapwood into the office. The crows had hoped to be asked to stay to supper, but Sir Aubrey did not dine with the detectives. However, they were paid off and got their bonus, along with their glass of beer, before they said goodbye to Clovis and were driven back to the station for the London train. The butler, who was not the old one who had sacked Bella, but a younger man with black hair, now led Clovis past the chest into which Dudley had locked Bernard, past the knight of armor out of which Dudley had jumped, and the picture of the man with the Turk's head impaled on a lance. Then he knocked on a heavy oaken door, announced, Master Tavner, Sir Aubrey, and withdrew. Over what seemed like acres and acres of rich, dark carpet, Clovis looked at Sir Aubrey Tavner, and Sir Aubrey Tavner looked at him. Clovis saw a stout, red-faced man with a white mustache and bushy eyebrows. He was leaning on a stick, so Clovis thought he must have had gout. Everyone older than 50 seemed to have gout and the sort of plays that Clovis had acted in, and he decided to be very careful and not bump into him. Sir Aubrey, on the other hand, saw the grandson of his dreams. Clovis's eyes were very blue, his hair was thick and golden. He bowed low over the hand stretched out to him. The Goodleys had been very keen on proper bowing. Well, my boy, here you are at last. What made you hide away so long? Clovis had thought of the answer to this one. Because I was afraid I was not worthy to fulfill my role. He looked at Sir Aubrey to see if he had overdone it, but he hadn't. Nonsense. You'll soon learn, my boy. And then you're not at all like your father. Not at all. I believe I take after my mother, sir, said Clovis. 
Since he had never seen his mother, who had dumped him in an orphanage as soon as he was born, he felt quite safe in saying this. All the same, you remind me of someone. Now, who could it be? Clovis waited nervously. Then, I know, said Sir Aubrey. Yes, your great, great, great uncle. Alwyn. He was an admiral in Nelson's Navy. Went down with a ship at the Battle of Nile. There's a portrait of him in the galley. I'll show you later. Clovis then asked what had happened to the head of the man who was strangling a snake, and Sir Aubrey said that Dudley had blasted it with a shotgun. He was after some poachers, he said, and fell silent, looking very sad. Splendid chap, Dudley, ask anyone. Clovis said that he had heard from his father how strong Dudley was, and tried to think if he had heard anything nice about Dudley, but he hadn't. Fortunately, since Sir Aubrey was looking very upset, the butler announced Mrs. Smith and her three older daughters. The youngest daughter, Prudence, was still a nappy and did not go out to dinner. Again, Clovis had no difficulty recognizing Mrs. Smith as the basher and her daughters as the one who were no use to Sir Aubrey because they were the wrong sex. How do you do, Aunt Joan, said Clovis, smiling winningly and hoping that the basher had settled down since her marriage. Well, you let us quite a dance, brayed Joan, and introduced her daughters. The girls were very thin and frail with straight fair hair and woebegone expressions like banshees. Hope, who was eleven, had buck teeth. Faith, who was nine, had trouble breathing through her nose. And Charity was so frightened of her mother that she stammered, but they were nice girls all the same. All three of them looked anxiously at Clovis. Their mother had said that one of them would have to marry him when they grew up so that their family could get a share of Westwood. The girls knew that Bernard had been mad and had run away from home and talked to housemaids and to rats, so the idea of marrying his son made them feel very frightened. But now as Clovis smiled and shook hands with them, they felt better. He did not look like a boy who ran away from home and talked to housemaids. The butler now announced that dinner was served. Clovis offered his arm, offered his arm to the basher, which he knew was correct because of all the plays with dinner party that he, he had acted in, and then they crossed the gallery and went down the great car stairway to the dining room. As soon as he saw the table with its snow-white cloth and smelled the faint warm smell of fresh rolls and roasting meat, Clovis knew it was going to be all right. He remembered the Hotel Paradiso and all the other places where he had eaten vile food and a smile cur curved his lips that made his face look very beautiful. Even his foster mother couldn't have cooked a better meal. The asparagus soup was delicate and creamy. The roast beef was brown and crispy on the outside and just a little pink in the middle. The potatoes melted in the mouth. And for dessert, they had bread and butter pudding with dollops of cream. Clovis ate, and as he did so, he decided he could probably hold out for a week or even two before he gave himself up. Finn would be glad of the extra time, and it would be a pity not to stay for the other things. Ginger pudding and boiled mutton with capers, perhaps? And there'd be proper crackling on the pork. As for the little banshees, when they returned home, they too were satisfied. I wouldn't mind marrying him, said the eldest Hope. I wouldn't either, said Faith. Nor me, said Charity. I w w wouldn't mind, too. Then they sighed. Mother will tell us which one it's going to be, said Hope, as long as it's not Prudence. Prudence was still in nappies and far too small to be in the running, but she had curls and a dimple, and her sisters hated her. As for Clovis, he lay freshly bathed in a linen nightshirt between cool and spotless sheets. No, no mosquito netting, no fly paper, no beetles. Yes, he would definitely hold out for at least a week. He had promised Finn, and he would do it. But Sir Aubrey was not yet in bed. In bed. He had limped up to the picture gallery at the top of the house and stood for a long time looking at the portrait of Owl and Taverner in his na naval uniform. Really, the likeness was extraordinary. The nose, the eyes, the mouth, the way his hair fell over his forehead, all of it was the same as at the boy who had come today. It happened sometimes like that, that a likeness skipped a few generations and then showed up stronger as ever, thought Sir Aubrey. That was the amazing thing about the blood. Chapter 16. Finn had been gone three days, and life in the bungalow seemed even more dismal than when Maya first came. Miss Minton saw that the lessons went on, and though Maya worked as hard as she had done before, she did so without joy. She didn't want to read about plants and animals any longer. She wanted to find them. She wanted to be out there in the forest starting a real life, and as much as Miss Minton loved books, she understood her. The weather, as the dry season got underway, became even hotter. In her room, Miss Mitten took off her corset and put it on again. Not because she was afraid of Miss Carter, but because she knew that British women did not throw off their underclothes, and because she had told Maya not to make a fuss when Finna went away. 
If Maya could behave well over the parting, she could behave well about the heat rash spreading up her back. Meanwhile, she watched Maya carefully because there was no doubt that the Carters were becoming very strange indeed. As Mr. Carter's business went from bad to worse, he spent more and more time at his study peering at the glass eyes. And since his own family would not look at them, he called in Maya. Look at this one, he said to her. It's the left eye of a tramp found dead in a ditch on Wimbledon Common. Look at the way those blood vessels are painting. You wouldn't uh, imagine a tramp could afford an eye like that. Perhaps he was a very important person before he became a tramp, suggested Maya, but the eyes were beginning to get into her dreams. Mrs. Carter had set up what she called her larder in a cupboard of the hall, but it was not a larder to store food. Instead, bottles of Instead of bottles of plum or pats of butter, the shelves held flasks labeled poison and masks for protecting the face and rubber gloves. There were glass jars of chloral hydrate and spray cans with nozzles and a very new large bottle labeled cockroach killer, keep away from fire. We'll be safe now, she told the girls. No creepy craw crawlies will get past us now. She had also started to talk to the picture of Lady Parsons in the wall of the drawing room. You were right. Maya heard her say to the lady's fierce red face, should have let Clifford go to prison instead of bringing him out here. Look what we have come to. And one morning, Maya came into the drawing room and found the portrait wreathed in red ribbon. I hope you haven't forgotten that today is Lady Parson's birthday, she said to the twins. Do you remember when she allowed you to share her cake? Yes, Mama, we wouldn't forget. What kind of cake was it, asked Maya. She had spoken without thinking, wanting to be polite. There was certainly nothing she was less interested in than the cake in which Lady Parsons had shared with Beatrice and Gwendolyn when they were still in England. The twins glared at her. Lady Parsons was theirs. Maya had no business even asking. It was a sponge cake with pink icing, said Mrs. Carter. No, it wasn't, Mother. It had white icing, corrected Beatrice. No, it didn't. It was covered with Mars pan and grayed chocolate, said Gwendolyn. Then they went on arguing, but Maya had forgotten the, them again, following Finn in her mind. Where was he? Did he have enough wood for the firebox? Were his maps accurate? Did he miss her at all? Finn did miss her. She would have been surprised to know how much. He had never sailed the Arabella alone for any distance, and it wasn't as easy as he'd hoped. While she was underway, he managed well, but when it came to anchoring in the evening or setting off at dawn, he would have given anything for another pair of hands. Not any pair of hands, Maya's. She had obeyed his orders quickly, but not blindly, and he had learned to trust her completely. And she was nice, fun, quick to catch a joke, and so interested in everything, asking about the birds, the plants. This morning he had found himself starting to say, Look, Maya, when he saw an umbrella bird strutting along a branch, and when he realized that she wasn't there, the exotic creature, with its sunshade of feathers, had seemed somehow less exciting. After all, sharing was something everyone wanted to do. He could hear his father calling out, Look, Finn, over there, a dozen times a day. But his father was dead, and he had left Maya, and suddenly being alone, which he had always enjoyed, turned into loneliness, which is a very different thing. He had anchored close to a sandbank, a beautiful place sheltered by large fronded palms, and found a nest of turtle eggs. A shoal of black banded fishes glided past the boat. He had caught some earlier using pieces of banana to bait his line, and they made a delicious supper. He had hardly touched his stores, and the Arabella was going steady. What's the matter with me, said Finn. He was doing what his father had suggested. He was going to see the Zanti, but now he wondered what it was all about. They were just as likely to put an arrow through him as to welcome him with open arms. The dog, who had been curled up on the foredeck, thumped once with his tail, and then got to his feet and offered him a wet nose for comfort. It's all right, said Finn to his dog. It's all right, Rob. But there was more to his unease than loneliness. He knew he could not have taken Maya. He had no idea how long the journey was going to end, how the journey was going to end, and in any case, Miss Minton would never have allowed her to come. But all the same, he felt he should not have left her. He remembered Clovis saying, but Maya shouldn't live in a house that's been cursed. Only that was silly. He told Furo and the others to look after her, and they had promised. That was the other side of him the native side, which went in for rubbish like premonitions and inklings, and things you felt without knowing why. Suddenly furious with himself, Finn crawled to his haversack and turned up the lamp and took out Caesar's Gaelic War. After marching from the country of the Menippi, he translated, 
and it became an ordinary he became an ordinary English school by doing his homework. When Finn had been gone for nearly a week, the great event which the children had been expecting, the twins had been expecting, actually happened. Colonel De Silva arrived at the police lodge, bringing the reward for the capture of Bernard Tavner's son. He brought it as he had promised in Brazilian notes so that it could be divided into two equal parts, but he warned the twins to get it into a bank as soon as possible. If you don't have an account, your parents could bank it for you. But the twins did not mean to do that. As De Silva left, they were already counting it out in their separate heaps on the dining room table. 20,000 each. For a short time, Beatrice and Gwendolyn were perfectly happy. Miss Mitten and the professor had become friends. He had taken the butterfly she had found to the collector in Manus who had paid her. He had also lent her a collecting tin and some preservative, and though so far she had not found anything else worth selling, she was secretly proud of becoming a naturalist. Because Maya now had lunch with the Haltmans after her music lessons, Miss Mitten lunched with the professor in a little cafe that he had shown her. But being friends did not mean blabbing out one's troubles, and Miss Mitten was slow to share with the professor her anxieties about Maya. It was only when he particularly asked her about it that she said, I'm not happy with the way that things are going at the Carters. The twins are bullying Maya more openly now, and their mother seems to live in a fantasy world. She talks to the portrait of Lady Parsons, and sometimes I'm afraid she... Miss Mitten stopped there, not liking to admit that her employer was possibly losing her mind. They will have anxieties about Mr. Carter's business, said the professor. I understand that Gonzales is banging for Carter's blood. He certainly seems to, uh, no, to owe enormous sums of money. Isn't there anywhere else that you can take Maya? Miss Mitten hesitated. Even to the professor, she preferred not to reveal her plan before she was sure that it could be carried out. I've written to Mr. Murray, was all she said. Then she asked about his work, and he sighed de deeply. Carruthers is dead, he said, and his large pink forehead creased like lines of a mournful pugs. Miss Mitten waited. She didn't think that she'd heard about Carruthers. He was a brilliant man, knew more about extinct animals than anyone I know, but they hounded him. Who hounded him? The proper scientists. You should have seen what they wrote about him in the paper. An unrealistic dreamer, a man who let himself be led away by myths and stories, always searching for the impossible. What was he searching for? The professor put down his fork. He seemed to be looking in the distance. Then he said, The giant sloth. The bones, you mean? The skeleton, like your rib? No, the beast itself. He was convinced that it wasn't extinct. Natives have always had a story about it. They call it the Mapo Mapogari, a giant creature with reddish hair which walks on curved claws. You get sightings of it every so often. He sighed. It was Carruthers who got me interested in sloth. We were friends at Cambridge, and now... How did he die? The professor shrugged. He was searching somewhere in the Mato Grosso and got a fever. It's not so difficult to die out here. Personally, I think they broke his heart. Miss Minton waited while he dabbed his eyes with a handkerchief, and she said, Perhaps it wasn't such a bad way to go. Still working, still searching. Better than dying in a hospital with strangers. Yes, you're right, but I wish. Something now occurred to Miss Minton. You don't think he was right, do you? The sloth is not extinct. You don't agree with him? The professor blushed. N no, no, he said. It's most unlikely. But he didn't meet her eyes. Miss Mitten now gathered up her belongings. I have to fetch Maya from her piano lesson, she said. But when she had left the restaurant, she did not go straight down to the Haltmans. She crossed the square, turned down the street to the Kaminsky's mansion, and asked to speak to the Countess. The professor was right about Gonzales. He arrived at the Carters the next day, along with two unpleasant-looking henchmen. Gonzales was a Brazilian man who traded in the Amazon for many years. He was not a nice man, but he dealt very fairly in business, and Mr. Carter had now exhausted his patience. Mr. Carter took him into the study, but the walls were thin, and it was almost impossible not to hear what Gonzales was saying. I've had enough, he said in Portuguese. Either you let me have what you owe me in full, or I will take legal action. Then Carter's voice, low and whining. I only need a few more weeks. They're bringing in a big batch of rubber from the north of the estate. It will fetch a good price. That's not what I've heard, said Gonzales. The voices went on for a while longer. Gonzales's voice loud. Carter's a low mumble. Mumble. Then Gonzales threw open the door, bowed to Miss Carter, and gathered his henchmen and was gone. For two days after Gonzales had come, Mr. Carter tried to sort out his papers and bills. He even went into the forest, a thing he did not do often to encourage those workers who were still with him. 
But then a little packet came from England with the greatest prize he had yet seen, a double set of navy blue eyes. They're from a captain in the French army. He was blown up in a battle. Look how they match, it's incredible. And he disappeared in his study again and wasn't seen except for meals. Mrs. Carter had started to write to Lady Parsons in England, covering the paper with her hand when anyone came into the room. She wrote several of these letters and tore them up, but in the end she was satisfied with what she had written and posted the letter herself in Manus. As for the twins, their happiness did not last long. At first they made lists of what they wanted to buy. The dresses, the shoes, the hat, the boxes of chocolate. If Beatrice decided to order a flounced party dress in pink organdy, Gwendolyn decided to order one in blue. When Beatrice thought she would buy some proper scent, Gwendolyn said she was sick of boring lavender water and she would have some too. You don't have to copy me, said Beatrice crossly, and Gwendolyn looked at her blankly. The twins had always copied each other. Mrs. Carter had asked them to share some of the money with their parents. Your father is having a hard time, girls, and I think it would be kind to let the whole family join in your good fortune, she said, but the twins absolutely refused. It's ours. We need it. We don't want Maya to have money and not us. We want her to go. So now the twins became suspicious, first of their mother, then of the servants. They're always hanging about, they said fretfully. This was true. Tappy and the others, remembering their promise to Finn, took every chance they could to see that Maya was all right. Hiding their money became the most important thing to the twins. At night, Beatrice hid her banknotes in an old doll's carriage, which she kept by her bed. Gwendolyn slept with hers under the mattress. They took the money with them to the lavatory. They brought it into the dining room when they were doing their lessons. By now, they stopped planning how to spend the money. They just wanted to look at it and count and gloat over it. From being suspicious of everyone else, the twins became suspicious of each other. They suspended a piece of cotton between their beds so that one of them couldn't creep out at night without waking the other. Then Beatrice developed a septic throat and couldn't go to dancing class, and Gwendolyn wouldn't go without her in case her sister stole the money while she was away. But wor worried Maya was not the way that the twins behaved. The twins had always been odd. What worried her was the feeling that Minty was hiding something from her, that her governess had a secret. A few days after Gonzales's visit, she knocked on Miss Mitten's door and opened it to find her kneeling on the floor and putting books into her trunk. She looked up quickly and shut the lid, but for the first time, Maya felt like she was interrupting something private. I'm putting some of these away. I found ants in the Shakespeare. They must be really tough ants, said Maya, to hold up against Mrs. Carter's sprays. Ants are tough, said Mrs. Minton, and changed the subject. But Maya continued to feel uneasy, for she had the feeling that what Miss Minton had been doing was packing. Oh, Finn, thought Maya, I know I should be glad you're free and happy, and I am glad. Only I really don't know what to do here anymore. But Finn wasn't happy. Both he and the boat seemed to ha somehow sluggish, and he couldn't quite get rid of the knot in his stomach. He had moored by a huge dyewood tree. The water flowed quietly into a deep channel. Nowhere better could be found. So why? He had his supper of beans and roasted maize. The deck was piled with chopped wood, and the dog had gone ashore to find his own supper and came back with a smug expression and blood on his jaws. Everything was fine. A group of howler monkeys came swinging through the trees, making their evening racket, half screeching, half laughter, and stopped when they saw the Arabella. Perhaps I should have gone to Westwood, thought Finn. They'd have knocked all this rubbish out of me, foreseeing disasters. What did he think could happen to Maya in the Carter's bungalow? The whole point about the Carter's bungalow was that nothing happened in it. It was the most boring house in the world, and the native people had promised to look after her. No harm will come to your friend, Furo had said. So why did the unease get worse all the time? He remembered saying goodbye to Maya. She'd come out of the house in her dressing gown. She ran so lightly, but when he'd hugged her, she felt wonderfully solid. No, Maya would be all right. I'm not going back, said Finn out loud. And in the trees, the monkeys threw back their heads and roared. That's where we're going to stop today. We'll pick up next time with chapter 17. We've been reading Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson, illustrated by Kevin Hawks, and published by Puffin Books. Once again, my name is Sarah Mori. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you soon. Bye.